I don't think you ought to be doing this to yourself, Andy. This is just shitty pipe dreams. I mean, Mexico is way to hell down there, and you're in here, and that's the way it is. Yeah, right. That's the way it is. It's down there, and I'm in here. I guess it comes down to a simple choice, really. Get busy living. You get busy dying. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where we continue our exploration of the Shawshank Redemption. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, my name is John Roca, and I'm a voiceover artist and host and producer and writer over at Collider Video. Excited to jump back into this movie that I love so much and probably taught me so much more about voiceover subconsciously than I ever knew before that this movie. I think what he masters in this film is the thing that I find myself saying to actors so often, which is just say the thing. <laughs> like you don't just, you're saying this, just say it. Yeah. Which is really the hardest thing to do is Morgan Freeman's just telling you the story. Actors hate when you tell them to stop acting. Yeah. They hate it because then they go, what did I go to school for for four right. years to learn? And it's like you learned to be yourself, to not act, to not act and just feel the, uh, I don't know, feel the uh, in visceral situation, the visceral uh, moments in the situation. That's I think the, yeah, I think the two things that come up the most and part of it is that I'm working a lot with student actors mm -hmm. who maybe don't have the level of experience, sometimes not the level of talent <laughs> um, frequently. Um, but the, the first thing is they don't know what they're saying. Like right. they literally don't understand what right. this line is. Sometimes they, I've had students where the, the first line of the scene is like, you're lying. That's not true. And then I ask them, what's not true? And they're like, that's not true. I'm like, yeah, but what is that? Wow. What are you talking about? Wow. They don't know. So the first thing is, what are you saying? And then the second thing is, if you know what you're saying, now just say it, yeah. you know? Exactly. And those things are really, really, really hard. Yeah. Um, but we are back in the Shawshank Redemption. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention, which is something really important, which is this is, in fact, the 25th anniversary oh, yeah. of Shawshank. So it's right. it, we didn't pick it for that reason, but it's nice that we're doing it, it works at out. a quarter century. Yeah. And as you said... Uh, oh, oh, 25 years. Okay. Yeah. Um, and where we left was we had just lost the great James Whitmore. Yeah. Brooks killed himself, and we are back with our prisoners. And we are at the library, and... And in comes Andy and Hadley, and there are all these boxes and all this stuff. And he gets a letter, and the letter reads, Dear Mr. Dufresne, in your response to your repeated inquiry, the state has given you funds, $200. And there's all these book plus books and sundries, and we see all these boxes of books. And, and then it says, please stop sending us letters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to which, of course, his response is, only took six years. I guess I'm going to send two letters a week now. <laughs> I love the persistence of Andy Dufresne. And this is when he starts to become a character that you really adore. Yeah. Right? This desire, this persistence, right? And the letters that he sends every week, that's a foreshadowing of what we're going to find out that he's been doing to get out of the prison. Mm -hmm. A little bit at a, little a time. Knocking a to little get bit the, away. Yeah, a little bit away to get the result yeah. that he wants. And as soon as he gets some of the result, he's going to double the effort even more. Even though everyone yep. tells me he tells him he shouldn't, this person says stop sending letters, don't break out of prison. He's gonna figure out a way to get what needs to get done. I, I can't imagine what it must have been like to be Andy Dufresne's parent. Oh, like, man. Dad, can I have can I have a little wagon? Dad, can I have a little wagon? <laughs> Dad, can I have a little wagon? <laughs> like the persistence of that child. Uh, was true. like you, he's gonna win. Yeah, true. Gonna break you down eventually. The dripping faucet. And as he's looking through all the stuff that we have uh, for the library stuff, he finds some records. Yeah. And he finds something that's special. And one of the guards kind of goes, hey, I'm going to go to the bathroom. And guard goes away. And Andy pulls out a record, puts it on the player, and it's Mozart. Yeah. Marriage of Figaro. And you could see what hearing that music means to him. Mm -hmm. And this is where Tim, Tim Robbins is. I don't think he gets enough credit for how good an actor he is. He's a subtle actor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And very, and, and you know, it's funny. We, way at the beginning of this podcast, we talked about the fact that the when Rob Reiner was talking about directing it, he was going to cast Tom Cruise 
and Harrison Ford. Mm. I think Tom Cruise is a great actor. I think he does things really well. He cannot do this. I don't think he was capable mm -hmm. of playing the cold, interesting, introspective Andy Dufresne. Right. I can't, I don't think he has that gear because he's so dynamic. Yeah. And that's not what this is. So when you see him hear this music and be moved by it, it's so powerful because you've never seen this from this guy, except possibly when he got the guys the beers. Right. That's the other time you saw this feeling. Because it's connecting back to being outside this prison again. Exactly. The beers and this moment. The yep. music reminds him. He probably listened to this yes. all the time. Yep, and he gets he was in prison. and he gets up and he gets the key and he locks that door. Yeah, and then he finds the microphone and the PA system and he puts it up against the speaker, and there's some s feedback, and then out across the the workout yard and out across the whole prison through every single speaker, mm -hmm. you hear the sound of Mozart. Literally a sweeping, yes, shot. With prisoners looking up, and Red looks up, and prisoners in the infirmary, and guards, and everyone. You could see that this experience is otherworldly. Mm. It is it is beautiful in a way that nothing they've experienced before. As, of course, the guard in the bathroom is freaking out. Right. You drops know, his magazine. He drops and he comes out, and the door is locked. Mm -hmm. And and the, and then we get, which is among my favorite bits of voiceover, I have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. Truth is, I don't want to know. Some things are best left unsaid. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words and makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a great place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage and made those walls dissolve away. And for the briefest of moments, every last man at Shawshank felt free. Wow. Yeah. It's great, great uh, dialogue, man. Great lines. Here's the thing that I don't think we really talk about with Red. Red is a brilliant writer. He is. You know what I mean? Because our senses, this is, yeah, these are his words. Well, he's a brilliant thinker. A brilliant else. thinker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like his. The, and sensitive. And sensitive. Yeah. And thoughtful and poetic. Mm -hmm. Poetic. Yeah. I mean, this is an amazing, which we don't, because it's interesting how there's the difference between Red the narrator and Red the guy who knows mm -hmm. how to get you things. Mm -hmm. They're not the same person exactly. Right. But this man says something profound. But you imagine the reason he's able to get things is because he has a silver tongue and he has a way to speak mm. to certain people of different walks of life to get what he needs, which is why he is in the position that he's in. And he's not the lyricist or the poetic guy. No. He may be poetic in spirit, but not in speech. And whereas Red is. And no. Red's not poetic in action. He's poetic in speech. Well, and it's in interesting that you say that because one of the things that we're going to get to later, Andy wants Red to, in Ziwat Neho. Yeah. You know, and Red doesn't think that he's going to be helpful. Yeah. And I think Andy sees this person, this poetic mm -hmm. person, mm -hmm. this person who can talk to other people, this person who kind of sees things deeply. Mm -hmm. I think Andy knows that that person is there, which yeah. is not a person that he regularly shows. Right. Um, of course, the warden is not pleased no. with uh, this opera playing, and they come to the door, and they knock on it, and they ask Andy to open the door, unlock the door, turn off that music, and what does Andy Dufresne do? Turns it up. I am warning you, Dufresne, turn that off! I love that moment so much. Moment of defiance. And that is Tim Robbins. Yep. That's his idea. Oh, really? Just turn it up? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, that was his idea. And when he turns it up and then he leans back yeah. and puts his hands behind his head, that is just, I think it's my favorite moment of the whole movie. I think that's a great point, Steve. A beautiful moment in the movie of who he is as a character and as a person. And then you cut right to Hadley knocking on the window with that baton of his yeah. with that smile a devilish <laughs> mouth. I know we were friends and I you helped me with this stuff, but 
I get to do what I enjoy as well, yeah. which is to beat the living shit out of you. Well, and I think too that it's it's probably not at Hadley for years. Oh yeah, that this guy's had this prisoner's kind of had something over on him. He's he, more intelligent than he. Yeah, yeah. I don't well, like it. And he and he owed it. He had he had to be nice to him. Yes, he did. You know, he helped him out. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it probably has continued to help him out for years mm-hmm. since then. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Andy's going to get a couple of weeks in the hole for that uh, little stunt, and uh, it's worth. And that's what he says when we come back to the mess a little while is that it was the easiest time he ever had because he had Mozart with him. Um, And then Haywood, of course, said, you didn't think you could play little Hank Williams. And Andy's going, well, I didn't have time to take requests. Um, and And the thing, too, he talks about is that having that music in his mind gave him the thing that helps you get through the hard times, which is hope. This starts to become in the second half of the movie a very central thing is this idea of hope, you know? Yeah. It's an interesting to thing to think of of when you're in the hardest time in your life, what is it that gives you hope? You know, yeah. what what is the thing you can hold in your mind? And for Andy, music is obviously mm-hmm. key. And and the next thing he wants to find out is, you know, how does is, is to connect with Red. Like, did you ever feel that way of music? And Red kind of says, Well, I used to play harmonica. Yeah. Um, but Red doesn't like this hope idea yeah. so much. Let me tell you something, my friend. Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. It's got no use on the inside. You better get used to that idea. Like Brooks did. And there's a great reaction from Red. And he gets up and he walks away. Mm-hmm. This is their biggest fight. Yeah. You know, this is the basic conflict between the two of them. Mm-hmm. Red is like, you got to get along. You got to accept where you are and you and don't have hope. It's too hard. Mm-hmm. And Andy goes, I can't, if I let go of hope, then I let go of everything, of yeah. life. Yeah. Well, and, and also for Red, it's instinctive for him to rebel against this notion because he's crushed all the hope inside of himself so that he doesn't feel a loss of it either and he doesn't feel let down or or uh um not have his expectations met because he's been rejected by so many parole boards over the years right. the hope just sets him up for more failure and so he's doesn't that's he's trying to drive it out of andy because seeing it andy reminds him of what he's lost and yeah. he doesn't want to be reminded of what he's lost well and he doesn't want andy to to be where he is yeah yeah. You know, he wants to protect his friend on yeah. some level. With, some level, sure. Yeah. Um, Morgan Freeman said an interesting thing about acting that I like quite a bit, which is he said, I get what I'm going to get on the page, but I can't get what you're going to get on the page. And that's how it gets twisted. And that's what makes it fun. Yeah. And that I think that's such a great point is, of course, you're going to study the script, mm-hmm. but you have no idea what that other actor is going to bring in. Right. So whatever you've studied, you're going to have to let go of on some way because they're going to come in with something else yeah the worst thing you do is be with an actor who tries to give you line readings oh i need you to say this so that my performance can be this i mean those are the worst actors i mean sometimes there's a discussion to have discussions are different than being told but do not tell right yeah i've seen it i've seen it a lot where one actor tries to particularly if you have because i watch student directors a lot yeah if you have a weak director then sometimes an actor will try to take over of course when rubber rubber shot yeah um, directors, that the, there's a certain degree where it's like you can't show weakness. Right. You know, you can show that you don't know something, and you can ask a question. Right. But you have to be the director because otherwise, either the DP or or a strong-willed actor, they'll just start walking all over you. And by strong-willed, you mean incredibly insecure because that's that's where that comes from—the desire to be seen in a certain way and have your performance stand out because you're in. You sure. don't trust the flow of yeah. the of the of the scene. Yeah. We're speaking of parole boards. You know, <laughs> we're back at the parole board. And same kind of shot coming in, and he sits down, and now we're at 30 years. Yeah. 30 years of a life sentence. And what does he say? You feel you've been rehabilitated? Oh, yes. Yeah. Without a doubt. Exact same speech mm-hmm. he gave 10 years before. And I can honestly say I'm a changed man. No danger to society here. Here's a question, and I'm not saying, I don't really know the answer to it, but... This performance, I think, is different from the first performance, mm-hmm. but I can't tell you exactly how it's different. Okay, you know, it's like it's like the facade is more cracked. It's starting to show. Yeah, and so that's where Andy Dufresne has changed his life, because Andy Dufresne makes him confront 
the reality of situations mm. a little more than he may want to. And the cracks you're seeing are the foundation that he has built within himself to survive the situation. And so by the time we get to the last parole board meeting, which we'll get to, which I'm sure we'll get to in just a little bit, he doesn't give to yeah. shits about what they think because he's finally come to terms with who he actually is. You, you know what I think too, is we just kind of touched on it, is that the, we just left the scene where he yeah. said hope is a dangerous thing. Right, right, right. And maybe t at the 20 year mark, he still had some. Yeah. And so when he gave that speech, it was with, with some belief that mm -hmm. maybe there was a chance it would work. And now he's given the same speech but he doesn't really have any belief yeah. behind it anymore yeah. that this could work. Yep. So it's just empty. And of course it doesn't work because he gets rejected. Yeah. 30 years. Jesus, when you say it like that. You wonder where it went. I wonder where 10 years went. But he does have a present for Red, which I like that he bought from one of his competitors. And it's a harmonica. Mm -hmm. I think that harmonica scares Red. Of course. On someone. Once again. Yeah. It's you're you're messing with this perfectly constructed yep. world that I've built so that I can function in this place and accept that I may never get out of this place. Right. Stop trying to make stop trying to remind me of what I lost. And um, Martin Sheen has a great line in Apocalypse Now when he's talking about we, you know which which we did where he says like the more they tried to make it feel like home, the yeah. more they missed it. Yep, and that's, that's what line. prison is too. Yeah, I, it's a great point. I, I totally agree because he's becoming as he says. Institutionalized. institutionalized yes yeah. exactly and he puts the harmonica back in the box and later on andy is back in his cell and he gets another gift too which is a tube and this is a replacement girl and we get marilyn monroe from Ooh. the seven year itch and the famous you know subway great mm -hmm. holding down the skirt picture yep um and red is alone in his cell and he pulls out the harmonica pl he puts it to his lips and he plays a single hesitant note it's a great it's a great moment it's symbolic as hell that's yeah. what it should be yep um and of course andy did write two letters yep. a week and now we got 500 bucks and we got a whole bunch more supplies and so not only are they looking through all their books and records and everything they got but they're busting through walls and building mm -hmm. what was kind of a storage room into a real library and i love i love that they're talking about books and andy's telling them where to put them so it's you know auto repairs and education mm -hmm. and then they when someone finds a book the count of monte cristo and they do the classic joke count of monte cristo that's Christo, you dumb shit. By Alexandri Dumbass. Dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> but even more, I love the line. It's like, you know what that's about? You know what that's about? Uh-uh. You'll like it. It's about a prison break. We'll be able to file that on the educational, too, oughtn't we? <laughs> By the way, Count of Monte Cristo is, I think, my dad's favorite book. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great movie. That no one gives love to it. Which one? The one with uh, Jim Caviezel mm. and Guy Pearce. Great adaptation of that mo of that book. I, I think I saw it on an airplane. Oh, okay. Which is the finest way to see a film. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's interesting. The thing I was thinking about about Connie Monte Cristo because it's a great book, and and there's several uh, versions of it, mm -hmm. a film version of it, is that it's not just about escape. It is about revenge. Right. That is its story. This book is not. This movie's not about revenge. No. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It certainly is about an escape. There's no, Andy has no thought of revenge. Well, yes and no, because I don't think he would have sent those documents to the newspaper reporters if he didn't feel a sense of revenge. Maybe not revenge, Steve, certainly justice. Justice. It's good But point. he's not going out justice. after Blanche. Right. No, no, he's not going after. Blanche or whatever his name is. Yeah, he's not he going after his warden and... or what. Yeah, or Blanche. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's not what his plan is. Right. I mean, he's going to do the right thing, I think, with the warden. Yeah. Um, And, uh, and I like, too, that. They, they named the library after Brooks. After Brooks, yeah. That's nice. And of course, we get to see Haywood singing, listen to Hank Williams and singing along. Terrible rhythm. Yeah. <laughs> Which I love. It's perfect. It's great. Um, and now we find out that the Wardens introduced this whole new program, and it's some kind of work inside out program where he is going to do good for the community by by having his prisoners do work outside of the prison and oh yeah, he's going to skim all the money off the mm -hmm. top. And we see when they're out doing some job that some guy comes up who his prisoners are taking the work away from. So not only is he making work from 
the jobs the prisoners are actually doing, but he's taking kickbacks yeah. from people to, to not have the prisoners work. So money is coming in from all over the place. Yep. And when you got a lot of money coming in, you know what you need? You need an accountant. Good accountant to take. <laughs> Funny that you mentioned that. We have someone very good, and <laughs> he is cooking all the books. Cooking them up. And we see Andy doing that, or he follows him, and this is the first time we see as he opens up that safe, which is behind that like needle point on the wall. Yeah. Oh, God, the warden's such a dick. He is a pretty big dick. Because <laughs> in addition to like having Andy do all this work for him, he's also... Take my clothes down to the laundry. Right. Which is an important plant that we're going to see. Have my shoes shined. Yeah. And uh, later on, we're talking to Red and talking about the kickbacks and all the dirty money. And Andy's describing how he cleans the money. I channel it, filter it, funnel it. Stock, securities, tax-free municipals. I send that money out into the real world. And when it comes back... Clean as a virgin's honey pot. Cleaner. By the time Norton retires... I've made him a millionaire. In the 60s or 50s when this is set. Yeah, this is probably a huge deal. Early 60s, I bet, at this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, that is a lot of money. You know, and, and, and at first, Red is kind of going, hey, you know, eventually they're going to get caught. All this stuff leaves a paper trail. And Andy's like, oh, you don't have faith in me. <laughs> I know you're good, Andy, but all that paper leaves a trail. Now, anybody gets curious, FBI, IRS, whatever, it's going to lead to somebody. I'm sure it is, but not to me. And certainly not to the warden. It's going to lead to this guy, Randall Stevens, yeah. and that this is someone that Andy's created, complete with social security numbers and IDs and everything you probably, and all, everything is that the warden has done is going to that guy. Um, and I love when Red hears all that. I love his responses. Did I say you were good? Shit, you're a Rembrandt. <laughs> <laughs> and Andy, the final line is, you know, the funny thing is, on the outside, I was an honest man, straight as an arrow. I had to come to prison to be a crook. <laughs> and Morgan Freeman's ha reaction <laughs> is just great. Ha! By the way, in the book, Andy created the secret identity before going to prison. Is that he, when he saw that the trial was going south, he took a whole bunch of money, created a new identity, invested the money in stocks, hid everything in the, so, in the uh, bank security boxes. Right way ahead of time which kind of makes you think that in the book he actually was planning to escape the whole time the whole time yeah and this all the money and it was his money whereas this it's all the warden's money right and that he did it as he was going along well i wouldn't say it's the warden's money fair <laughs> not all of it at least it is the ill-gotten gains yes of the all of these scams on the backs of some of these prisoners and again these are things where i think this is better yeah I, it's and it's not well, that, in the book. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I don't. It's not that I really like the book, mm -hmm. but I think this is better. We're playing chess, and now Red's kind of pushing him a little bit. Ever bother you? I don't run the scams, Red. I just process the profits. It's a fine line, maybe, but I've also built that library and used it to help a dozen guys get their high school diploma. Why do you think the warden lets me do all that? And then we hear that big siren again, which means more prisoners are coming in and we get a new guy who is a breaking and entering young punk rock and roll cocky as hell. And that's Tommy played by Gil Bellows. Gil Bellows. Still working Gil Bellows. Yeah. I think he's good. I think he's, he's a good, good actor. actor. Hell yeah, dude. I love when he shows up on things. Do you know who was originally cast? Benicio Del Toro. I had no idea about this. Ooh. That's a good one. Brad Pitt. Oh, Perfect. And Brad Pitt, it, he just blew up so much after Thelma and Louise that he, I mean, he, he was signed. Yeah. And he backed out. <laughs> I'm going go on bigger things. <laughs> Brad Pitt would have been great. Yes, he would have. He would have been great in this. Um, but I think Gil Pellos is great. And what's interesting is because our expectations from when the new guys come in is, you know, fresh fish and all that horrible stuff that happens and how hard it is your first night. That doesn't affect Tommy at all. No. <laughs> in fact, he's down with the guys in the mess. And rather than being like the new guy that everyone picks on, he wins them all over immediately. Yeah. They all like him a lot. Um, and kind of, you know, he's telling jokes and he guess he's been in and out of prison and, mm -hmm. you know, his whole life. He <laughs> and gets it. And Andy, and I think this is really interesting, says, you know, maybe you should try a different profession, <laughs> which is great because I don't think the Andy of 12 years ago would have talked to the new guy like no, this. No, right. He's seasoned now. He's a veteran of the, of the, of the system. Now. And he's gained some social skills mm -hmm. and some friends. And if yep. you, I don't think he had friends really out in the world. Yeah, probably not. 
I don't. Th- I think there were bankers that he was social with. No one comes to visit Andy Wise in prison, so that tells Whoa, you. Whoa, that is a great point. That tells you he has no friends. He because I think he was a cold fish. Yeah. He had you maybe know. work associates. Yes, but not friends. Yeah. Whereas now he genuinely does have friends. Mm-hmm. And when Tommy asks him what's he in for, he says, "Me, lawyer, fuck me. <laughs> Everybody's innocent here. Don't you know that?" Yeah, he's become one of the guys. Yep. Back in the library, Tommy is kind of angling around asking for Andy's help to get his GED. Um, and Andy agrees. And this kind of becomes the new project. And we yeah. go into a nice little teaching montage. We get some narration from Red of like, this is how Andy survived. The library was a project. Teaching people is a project. Mm-hmm. And Tommy is what's keeping him going now. And of course, now we know that time continues to pass. And the reason we know so much time has passed is because he has a new poster. Yeah. Raquel Welch. Raquel Welch, Welch yeah. From 1 million BC. Yep. That's 1967, <laughs> which I think they mess up because they say he escaped in 66. And oh, this okay. movie came out in 67. But right. And now Tommy's taken his test, which is, seems like it was a year, a whole year later mm-hmm. of practicing, finishes the test, and Tommy is pissed because yeah. he thinks he blew it. He tries, he tries to throw away the test. He says this is worthless and kind of swears at Andy and loses his cool. And later on... As young men do. Yeah. Tommy feels bad that he let Andy down and he's talking to Red and he asks Red, no, really, what's he in for? And he's like, oh, well, murder. And he explains that, you know, caught the golf pro with his wife and killed them both. Yeah. And there's a look from Gil Bellows. And then we hear him telling this story that he was in another jail. He had a new cellmate. Mm -hmm. That cellmate was a scary guy and told, and one night he asked him who he killed. And as he's telling the story, we go into a flashback. It's really the only time we leave this prison and you know with our guys yeah. and we see a genuinely creepy dude <laughs> with some really scary bad teeth yeah and a weird weird laughing gestures yeah he wakes up gives me shit so i killed him him and this tasty bitch he was with <laughs> and that's the best part she's fucking this prick see this golf pro but she married some other guy <laughs> some hot shot banker <laughs> and he's the one they pinned it on <laughs> and suddenly we know andy is innocent he's innocent for real and not only that but we've got evidence that he he could get out yeah. and we see andy's reaction to him and the next thing that we do is go see the warden what amazes me most is you were taken in by it Sir? Well, it's obvious this fellow Williams is impressed with you. He hears your tale of woe and quite naturally wants to cheer you up. And then Andy's go, yeah, but we could find the guy. So we'd never be able to find the guy. Yeah, but we could find his records. It's like, no, we couldn't. And and the warden keeps resisting and resisting. Uh, This is so great. And then Andy Dufresne says... How can you be so obtuse? Obtuse. By the way, I use this all the time with people now. <laughs> I do, I, ever since this movie, every once in a while I'll bring it out. Why are you being so obtuse? What did you call me? Obtuse? Is it deliberate? Son, you are forgetting yourself. Because I think that's the real Andy. Mm-hmm. Th- this is the real person that he has been hiding. Mm-hmm. The person who's smarter than the warden, who was right. more successful than the warden, who, you know, better educated than the warden. Yep. And he's not been that person. And then he makes an even worse mistake. Sir... If I were to ever get out, I would never mention what goes on in here. I'd be just as indictable as you for laundering that money. Oh, Andy. And you see the warden. Everything changes right in that moment. Don't you ever mention money to me again, you sorry son of a bitch. Not in this office, not anywhere. Get in here now. I was just trying to set your mind at ease, that's all. Sir, I, I didn't Solitary, a month. Yes, sir. Hot. And Andy gets dragged out going, this is my life. Well, and here's the deal. Like, just by saying that, the relationship between them changed. Oh, yeah. Completely. Like, irreparably. Yeah. He becomes now subservient completely to the warden. Yep. He's, it's back to the other situation. No, he's not getting anally raped, but he's certainly getting his life raped by the warden well, and, over and, and over and, and over and, again. And the, the fragility of his situation is suddenly like very, very clear. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really, and it's funny. I was, so I was thinking about this. Part of what makes this movie so painful is just the plight of this innocent man. Yeah. You know, for 30 years or something, or I guess it's 20 plus years yeah. um, in prison. And it just seems so horrible that someone would endure this and of course we have innocent men in prison and women in prison all over the country and i was Mm -hmm. thinking i was kind of doing some reading on the innocence project 
so far with the Innocence Project alone, there are 362 post-conviction exonerations based on DNA evidence. Wow. And what they believe is that there's probably 10 times that much in prison right now for things they didn't commit. Mm -hmm. And there's all this new research on false confessions and how right. people are bullied or pressured into confessions. There was that Netflix show about the guy's nephew, yeah. which I know there's a second part of it, which I haven't watched the second mm -hmm. part of the mm -hmm. thing, but it's like, you know, there's so many people facing this. And one of the things that I think is interesting, and I don't know quite how to put it, is that I think we're more drawn to a story where someone who's from a high place in society comes down. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that there are far more people, you know, a rich white guy mm -hmm. is far more likely not to get put into prison for something he didn't do than a poor person of color. Yeah. You, you got to try. If you're rich and white, you got to try really hard to mess up your defense. I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, the, 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 if you don't have proper representation and the fact is, is that, I think, you know, for the most part, police do an excellent job. For the most part, it's fairly obvious who uh -huh. did what they did. But there are lots of times, like, you know, you've seen Hurricane right. and there, you know, Reuben Carter and that whole story of sure. like, you know, there's a person and that, and witnesses can get manipulated into mm -hmm. seeing someone. And then once they lock into, oh, that was the person, then they're 100% sure that was the person. And it was right. really that that was the first photo the police showed to them after the thing. And now what they're remembering isn't the person from the crime, but they're remembering the photo that they saw. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing happens all the time. Yep. You know, so it's just, you know, we feel so much for Andy Dufresne, but I hope that we also go watch this movie and go, oh, let's think about yeah. how our justice system works and how, you know, and, and maybe give some money to the Innocence Project. Maybe I'll even put up a link to the Innocence Project on uh, on the Facebook page. Of course, the prisoners, all of our guys react to this. And who feels the worst but Tommy, you know, because he realized this guy's actually really innocent. And he's been in prison for 19 years so far. And that's when the mail comes. And what's in the mail? Tommy actually passed that test. Yep. And the person who finds, and then they go down to the hold. There's a little window that opens up and someone leans in to a very messed up looking Andy Dufresne and says, hey, he got a C plus. I thought you might like to know. Which means some of the guards are still... Oh, yeah. They still are looking out for him. They know the warden is a, is a criminal. Yep. Tommy is like mopping and the guards say, hey, the warden wants to talk to you. And they take him outside the gate. This is where you already should be worried. Yep. And the shot is beautiful. It's the warden and Tommy and they're in the dark, surrounded by black. Way in the distance, there's some blue light. There's bits of light everywhere. And and I think it's a good time to talk to a person about a person that we have not talked about this whole uh, movie. Yeah. Which is the cinematographer, Roger Deakins. Roger Deakins. Oscar winner, yeah. finally, Roger Deakins. I think he is the unsung hero of this film. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and it was funny. I just found out the reason he got hired was because Tim Robbins had just in Hudsucker Proxy. Oh. So when they cast Tim Robbins, he said, you should look at this Deacon's guy and yeah. Frank Darabont looked at him and saw all the Coen brothers films he did. And he went, wow, this is the guy. Mm -hmm. And of course he is one of the great cinematographers of all time. Mm -hmm. And if you watch how the movie's filmed, I, you know, I'm not, I don't mean this in any way as disrespect to Frank Darabont, but he's a first time movie director. Yeah. He has never done any, he's a screenwriter. He's never done anything like this before. And the scale, the camera movement, like you think about, if you look at a, a great study for a, a directing student would be to look at the scenes in the mess mm -hmm. where they're sitting across the table and it's the same group of guys sitting around a table talking. Every time they film those scenes, they do it differently. Yeah. Sometimes it's in twos, sometimes it's a single, sometimes it's a master, sometimes it's a moving master, sometimes the camera circles, sometimes it's pushing in. And, and that takes a genius cinematographer. Yeah. And that is what they have in Roger Deakins. Mm -hmm. I mean... Uh, as you say, finally got yeah. his Oscar yeah. for Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. 2049. Yeah. So the war, I think this scene is fascinating. It's evil. Oh, yeah. It's it's the, I think it's the first act of evil that we see in the movie. Just blatant evil. Yeah. Right? Because. I he, mean, other than the guy killing the the wife and her lover. Oh, at the beginning of the yeah. movie. Yes, of course, of course, of course. But uh, even the fat kid getting beat up, or the fat guy getting beat up at the beginning of the movie by Hay, Hay, uh, Haywood and oh no, by uh, Hadley. Hadley, that's a that's an accidental death. They didn't intend to kill him. Right. The warden intends to kill Gilbella. Well, and it's so cold blooded. It's it so is. manipulative. It and the, and the way he asks, it's so it's just like. I tell you, son, this thing really came along and knocked my wind out. The right thing to do. Sometimes it's hard to know what that is. 
I need your help, son. If I'm going to move on this, there can't be the least little shred of doubt. I have to know if what you told to Frayne was the truth. Of course, Tommy is seeing this like he's on mm -hmm. Andy's side, right? Which isn't so smart. And he goes, but he goes, yeah. And he said, you'd be willing to testify. And he goes, absolutely. Yeah. And the warden goes, that's what I thought. Oh, and he had given uh, Tommy a cigarette too, mm -hmm. you know, a last smoke, if you will. Yeah. And the warden drops his cigarette on the ground and steps it out and looks up at the tower. And who's in the tower but Man. with a rifle. This is the moment, too, that I now, and I remove all sympathy for Hadley after this moment. Like, the warden was already an evil son of a bitch. Hadley's a moron. Hadley's a moron. A violent moron. Yeah, he's a violent moron. He's, a, he's like a dog, an angry dog. Yeah. You don't feed it enough, it's going to do whatever it's going to do. And it's too dumb to know better. This moment, though, is his, he's committing murder here. Yep. Intentional murder. Shoots a guy in the back. Yeah. He's no longer a guard. He is now a criminal himself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, I think he's always been a horrible person. And I think. Right. But, but he did it within a structure, mm -hmm. you know, where he was obeying a certain culture. Right. To some degree. He's within the system. Yeah. But this, this is beyond the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he steps into the light and fires, and then he disappears back yeah. into the black again. Beautiful cinematography. Mm -hmm. And two things about this. One, again, the warden claiming to be religious. Yep. Like him allowing prisoners to be beat. I can see in a in a twisted way that he goes, "Oh, I am the the arm of God. Right. I am I am the, I am being justice, and justice is harsh." Right. You know, spare the rod and spoil the child. I'm sure he could be thinking that. There's nothing he can be thinking here other than I am murdering someone to cover my own criminal yep. deeds. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. and he might not have that thought, but that is what's happening. I just wonder what he told Hadley. Yeah. Well, Hadley's getting paid off on this thing too. Yeah, there you go. You know, we're all going to go down. One other thing in the book, Tommy doesn't get killed. Oh, Tommy, rather than being a negative reinforcement killing him mm -hmm. tommy gets sent up to a minimum security prison as a gift to keep him quiet wow and again this is better yep yeah i and, and i love stephen king it's not and i love the novella it's really right. good but i just think these little it's like when we talked about well i think shawshank um rita hayworth and shawshank redemption is a far better book than the book jaws mm -hmm. but steven spielberg did all sorts of stuff that made that story better than what was in the book yeah Solitary, Hadley opens the door and in comes the warden. I'm sure by now you've heard a terrible thing. A man that young, less than a year to go, trying to escape. Broke Captain Hadley's heart to shoot him. Truly it did. We just have to put it behind us. Move on. And Andy's response is, it's done. Everything stops. Get someone else to run your scams. And man, the warden now. Nothing stops. You will do the hardest time there is. No more protection from the guards. I'll pull you out of that one bunk, Hilton, and cast you down with the sodomites. You'll think you've been fucked by a train. In the library? Gone. Sealed off, brick by brick. We'll have us a little book barbecue in the yard. We'll see the flames for miles. We'll dance around it like wild engines. You understand me? You catching my drift? Or am I being obtuse? Or am I being obtuse? <laughs> there, yeah, yeah. And they then then the last line is give them another month to think about it, and they close the door. Yeah. Being doing this scene was supposed to be in the warden's office. Oh wow! Again, Tim Robbins' idea to have it in the hole. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, he's a director. It's more evil. Yeah, right. right yeah. Right. Well, it's funny though because if you think of Bridge on the River Kwai, there's so much made out of um, Alec Guinness's walk from the hole to the office mm -hmm. of the colonel, mm -hmm. um, and 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 so I can see that's good too. Right. But in this, having him just in the hole, I think is great. Yeah. It's later. And he's sitting up against the wall and he looks fairly shattered. And Red walks up and stands next to him. And I, I, I think Tim Robbins is great in this scene. And this is where, I think you talked about this in part one. This mm -hmm. is where he says, I killed her, Red. 
I didn't pull the trigger. But I drove her away. And that's why she died, because of me, the way I am. You know, I loved her, and I didn't know how to show it, and that's why she went to this guy, and that's why she's dead. Yeah. I, I think that's, I think it's taken him the 20 years to learn this. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't make you a murderer. Bad husband, maybe. Feel bad about it if you want to, but you didn't pull the trigger. No, I didn't. Somebody else did. And I wound up in here. <laughs> bad luck, I guess. It's really the first time we hear weakness from Andy. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, I was just in the path of the tornado. I just didn't expect the storm to last this long. Hmm. And it's the first time Andy is, is breaks. Yeah. We see him break, right? Because he's older. And for those of you youngins listening to us, as you get older, it's easier to break you in certain moments because you're, you're just more tired. You don't have the resistance like you had before. And so Andy's there and he's just like, I, the tor didn't, they didn't know the tornado was going to last this long. Right. Cause when you're young, you, you feel like you can handle it as you get older. It just wears you down. Yep. And so that's what he's talking about in that moment. For me, at least that's what I take from it. And, but he ends the scene still being yep. resilient. Well, there's the moment, I mean, we've seen it in so many movies in Lawrence of Arabia where after being tortured, mm, he said, right. I, I would have told him anything. Yeah. I mean, how many months can he stand in the hold? And remember, he told the warden, I'm not going to keep working for you. Right. But he is. Yeah. You know, on some level, Shawshank is winning. Yeah. You know, I mean, Andy's still going to be Andy. Yeah. But, and then he asks Red, you think you'll ever get out of here? Yeah. One day when I got a long white beard and two or three marbles rolling around upstairs, they let me out. <laughs> And that's when Andy starts talking about Ziwatanejo. Yeah. Which is a great name. And that it's, it's got to be a Schmodown question down the road, Steve. Oh, I just have yeah. a feeling. Z well, I'm going to memorize this shit. John, Ziwatanejo. Ziwatanejo. All right. Um, and it's in Mexico. It's on the Pacific Ocean. I love what Andy says. He says, You know what the Mexicans say about the Pacific? They say it has no memory. That's where I want to live the rest of my life. Warm place with no memory. And by the way, the Pacific, that means peace. Yeah. You know? And and again, we get to the symbolism of what has he just gone through? He's just gone through his 40 days in the desert, you know? Yep. And now he's talking about heaven. He's talking about a place that can wash away all his sins. Mm, good point. He's talking about redemption. Yeah. You know? I mean, like, there's so much that you can get. And who has he been, who tempted him in the desert in 40 years? Mm -hmm. The devil. Right. You know? Warden is the devil. Yes. And he talks, you know, his plan is to fix up a hotel and get a boat and to take people on charters. And he probably could use a man out there who could get things. I don't think I could make it on the outside, Andy. I've been in here most of my life. I'm an institutional man now. It's like Brooks was. Wow, well, you underestimate yourself. I don't think so. In here, I'm the guy who can get things for you, sure, but outside, all you need is the yellow pages. Hell, I wouldn't even know where to begin. And you know what? There's truth there. Yeah. He spent 30 years figuring out how Shawshank works. Yep. And really what he says is, I'm an institutional man now, like Brooks. And Andy thinks he's underestimating himself. And I think what we're going to find out is it's a real close call. Yeah. It's going to be real, real close. And the idea, just the idea of the Pacific Ocean, Red says, that scares me to death. Mm -hmm. I get that too, you know, that you can look out at something so big and just feel tiny sure, and scared and vulnerable. And I like what Andy says. He says, I didn't shoot my wife and I didn't shoot her lover. Whatever mistakes I made, I paid for them and then some. That hotel, that boat. I don't think that's too much to ask. I don't think you ought to be doing this to yourself, Andy. This is just shitty pipe dreams. Here's what I like about that line. What does Andy have to crawl yeah, through to right. get out? Pipe full of shit. A pipe full of shit. <laughs> Mexi then, but Red goes on. Mexico is way the hell down there, and you're up here. And He's that's angry. the way it is. He is angry. Yeah, yeah. He's angry. I mean, Mexico is way the hell down there, and you're in here, and that's the way it is. Yeah, 
Right, that's the way it is. It's down there and I'm in here. I guess it comes down to a simple choice, really. Get busy living. Or get busy dying. Get busy living or get busy dying. Yep. I don't think he can hear that. I think that's just too hard. Because what Andy just said, really, yeah. is you're getting busy dying. Yeah. That's what you're doing right now. Yeah. And it's an interesting, Red's still saying, stop hoping. Right. And Andy's saying, if I stop hoping, I'm, I'll be dying like you. I'll tell you a personal story, Stephen. I don't want to take too much time with it, but when I saw this film is when my life started to change. Really? Because of that scene. It's my favorite scene in the movie. Sure. I, for whatever reason, had never heard that phrase before. Get busy living or get busy dying. And it was, I was 24 or something, 23, whenever this film came out, I was pretty lost in my life. Even though I was going to the military and I was in the military and doing whatever, I knew I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. I just, I wanted to be something. I wanted to be the actor. I wanted to do all those kind of things. And I didn't know if I could. And I didn't know if I had faith in myself to try. And when I watched this movie, and this is why, this is why I love films, the power of films changed my life. That scene stayed with me. The get busy living and get busy dying. And it ruminated on it. And slowly but surely, I went back to community college to get my A degree, which led me to Florida State, which led me to pursue my life as an actor for as long as it, which led me to hear it, which led me to where I'm at now, which led me to this seat sitting in front of you. But that scene was the scene where I started to go like, I can't keep complaining about my life and not doing anything about it. And this was the line that stuck with me get busy living or get busy dying and so it's you know that's why the film has such a special resonance for me because it really did in essence change my life whereas malcolm x in 92 changed my approach to to getting out of college and getting out of fraternity in 94 it was this film that like woke me up to what to him having to do something to take control of my life i mean in a weird way that is why we're sitting here yeah we're sitting here because we both have had those experiences mm -hmm. and we believe that the film, great films, yeah. have the power to give you those moments sometimes. Absolutely. And sometimes it's just one line. I mean, that line, get busy living or get busy dying, I mean, that's that's a lot. Yeah. That is a whole that that is a whole philosophy of life right. summed up in one moment on screen. Mm -hmm. And then as Red's trying to go, Andy asks him one more says one more thing. And he tells him this story about this tree where he proposed to his wife and he made love mm -hmm. under this tree. And there, under this tree, under this wall, is a rock that doesn't belong there, a rock of obsidian, of volcanic glass. <laughs> and he says, Promise me, Red, if you ever get out, find that spot. And Tim Robbins' performance, there's so much intensity there in this moment that we haven't seen through the whole film. Like The stakes are this high for yeah. me. Yeah. And he's like, well, what are you... What, what's there? And he's, what's there? He's like, you just have to go and see. Yeah. Yeah. Later on, we're back at the mess with the guys. Andy's not there and Red is worried. He, he thinks Andy's talking funny. Something yeah. bad is going to happen. And then we find out that he, from Haywood that Andy just asked him for six feet of rope. <laughs> I love their reaction. Haywood, you didn't think anything of it? Well, it's Andy. I didn't say Andy, anything. Andy, yeah. <laughs> um, I love how they give Haywood so much shit for that. We're back up with the warden. It's time to go. And again, he opens up the safe and, yeah. and we see Andy. By the way, they've done a really subtle job of aging Tim Robbins yeah. in the film. Yeah. It's not a lot. No, no, no. It's, it's just enough. Just a little. Yeah. And the warden, again, is giving him instructions. Get my stuff down to laundry and shine my shoes. I want them looking like mirrors. Does that remind you of uh, Basic? Yeah. Having to shine some shoes. Oh, yeah. And Andy seems just kind of broken. Yep. Walks over to those shoes, looks down at them. We see his brown, beat up old work shoes. And he starts shining those shoes. Mm -hmm. Walking back to the cell blocks, he's in deep thought. He makes eye contact with Red, and Red is worried. Mm -hmm. And Andy goes in. He sits down in his bed. Lights go out. The lighting is fantastic. It's yeah. just a little bit of light on his face. Mm -hmm. And we see he has the rope. And I go like, when you first see this film, what are you thinking? Yeah. You know, sure. what do you know? What do you think mm -hmm. is about to happen? Yeah. And Red is, sits alone in his cell, and of course he can't see Andy. And so he says, I've had some long nights in stir. 
Alone in the dark with nothing but your thoughts, time can draw out like a blade. That was the longest night of my life. Here's what's interesting. And again, this is why I think what Frank Darabont did with the story is so great. Red has a long night of the soul worrying that Andy's going to kill himself. Right. On the night that Andy is, in fact, escaping from prison. Mm -hmm. In the book, Tommy isn't killed. Tommy goes off to a minimum security prison. Right. Therefore, Andy isn't in the emotionally dark place that Red sees. So Red can't have the same long night in the soul right. that he has in this version because of what's happened with the warden and Tommy being killed and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that it's not just that killing Tommy is a better idea, but it's also the effect. And this is the thing that people don't generally understand about screenwriting. It's effect that it has on the next scene. And the next scene mm -hmm. is the resonances of it change the no nature of everything that's come. It comes after. Yeah. It's the morning. Red is comes out of the cell. And of course he looks around and Andy doesn't come out of the cell. And, they do a count and there's someone missing. They realize it's Dufresne and the guard comes down. And of course, what's Red thinking at this moment? He thinks that Andy's killed himself. He's killed himself. Right. And the guard comes down, you know, with threats as you normally do. And then... You better be sick or dead in there. I shit you not. Oh, my holy God. And we don't see what he sees. And then the warden is changing his shoes and he opens up the box. And inside that shoe box are Andy's brown work shoes. Yep. That is so great. <laughs> and the siren goes off. And his look up when he hears the siren. Yep. Great. I want every man on this cell block questioned. Start with that friend of his. Who? Him. And the warden is freaking out. I want him found. Not tomorrow, not after breakfast. Now. Yes, sir. Calls in red. Like, what did you see? He's like, I don't, he didn't say anything to me. Yeah. Um, you two are thick as thieves. Yep. And which is an interesting thing to say to a couple of cons. <laughs> well, Lord, it's a miracle. Man up and vanished like a fart in the wind. Nothing left but some damn rocks on the windowsill and that cupcake on the wall. And he picks up those rocks and goes, It's a conspiracy. And he starts throwing rocks, throws one at red, and throws it out. Flips out. And then he turns to Raquel Welch and he throws a rock at Raquel Welch. And we don't see it, but we hear the sound. Yeah, and everybody freezes. And the, we hear paper tear. You expect yeah. to hear stone. Yeah. You hear paper tear. And there's a long, long reaction and a slow walk over to that poster. And we see them through the hole. Yeah. Looking into the poster. It is, it is a perfect, perfect movie moment. It's a great shot. The ripping down of the poster and the slow pullback yep. of the camera in that hole to show you how long that hole was and how long Andy dug that thing out. And we hear Red's narration in 1966, Andy Dufresne escaped from Shawshank. All they found of him was a muddy set of prison clothes, a bar of soap, and an old rock hammer. Damn near worn down to the nub. I remember thinking it would take a man 600 years to tunnel through the wall with it. Old Andy did it in less than 20. <laughs> and then we go back to the story. And here's what I think is so fascinating in the way this movie is told, is that the most exciting thing that is happening in the film mm -hmm. is hidden from every single character in the film yep. and from us. Mm -hmm. And now, so we never, I mean, there were probably so many times where Andy was sitting terrified that he would be overheard or Andy carving out that Bible or all these things that he did, yeah. all the figuring out how to go and where the pipes were. And maybe he did research on the plans of the prison, maybe right. all that stuff you would normally see in a movie about an escape. It's off screen. Yeah. That is fact, because that's not actually what the movie, it's not about the mechanics of the, of the escape, right. but we see it now. We go back in time and we see that moment where he knocks out a piece of the wall and we on accident on accident and we hear uh red talk about geology is the study of pressure and time that's all it takes really pressure and time that in a big goddamn poster and we see him walking out in the yard and pulling a little great escape as he spreads the, the <laughs> wall around um, which, by the way, Frank Darabont loved, loved The Great Escape and yeah. knew that he was referencing that. <laughs> and we go back to that night with the warden. And now we see when Andy is get, gathering his stuff that he switches the books and places the real books 
in his back and yep. something else goes in to the safe. And Andy picks out a suit when he's doing the laundry. And then Red says, the guard simply didn't notice, and neither do, do I. Seriously, how often do you look at a man's shoes? And the camera tilts down, and we see that he's not wearing those brown shoes. He's wearing those black shoes of the wardens, and they are shining like glass. Mm -hmm. Back in the cell, he takes off his prison uniform. He's wearing the suit after that. He loads all his things in a plastic bag. And then we see him climbing through the tunnel down into this area where all the pipes are. He climbs down there. Um, there's lightning and thunder, and he goes down to a big pipe and he starts hitting it. He has to time it with the thunder, which is, I guess that's why he picked this knife. And he breaks that pipe and shit just explodes up at him. And to crawl to freedom through 500 yards of shit smelling foulness I can't even imagine. Or maybe I just don't want to. Which, by the way, was water, chocolate syrup, and sawdust. 500 yards, just shy of half a mile. <laughs> that math is not great. A mile is about a, just shy of a third of a mile, but it doesn't sound as good. Oh. <laughs> um, and then he, you see him go out of the pipe into this stream, which we think of as cleansing, but apparently that stream was rated toxic by the EPA. Oh. It was filled with horrible chemicals from runoff from a real factory, Shit. and it was very dangerous. And so Tim Robbins had, was much more dangerous him going in the stream that was supposed to clean him off wow. than climbing through the pipe full of shit, which was filled with chocolate syrup Shit. and sawdust. <laughs> Yikes. Um, and then we Why get Why do they the put actors through that? It makes no sense. All right. Yeah. <laughs> But they do. I mean, well, because you got to get your damn shot. I guess so. There's so much pressure to get the shot. Yeah. Um, and the next shot is remarkable, yeah. which is shirt off, under the rain, arms in the air, mm -hmm. in a moment of total purifying, glorious rebirth. By the way, when Jesus dies on the cross, lightning happens, mm -hmm. uh, rain the splitting of things, building class. So it was like this whole thing, this whole thing is, as you said, the symbolic nature of this it is, all. And it is a resurrection. Mm -hmm. A you resurrection. Know? It is also a baptism. Yes. You know? It's Bapti also... Absolutely a baptism. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's both of those things. Yep. And after we see this little sequence, we're back with the warden yep. looking through that hole. And we hear Red say the next morning, right about, right about the, the time, time Raquel was spilling her little secret, a man nobody ever laid eyes on before strolled into the main national bank until that moment, he didn't exist. All the proper ID, driver's license, social security card, signature was a spot on match. And there's Andy Dufresne in a suit. Yeah. Getting a cashier's check. And they're sorry to lose his business. <laughs> and they say, anything else we can do? He says, yeah, mail these off. And what does he mail off? All the stuff to All get the, the warden killed, you know, yep. just arrested. Mm -hmm. And we're back at the prison and the warden hears a siren. Yeah. So he goes over to the safe, opens up the safe. Inside the safe is Andy's Bible. Mm -hmm. There's a note and it says, Dear Warden, you were right. Salvation lies within. And he opens it up. Mm -hmm. And instead of the pages, there is a cutout of the rock hammer. <laughs> and what chapter of the Bible is it? Oh, uh, I don't remember. Exodus. Exodus, of course. Yeah. Right. Um, and we see the DA walking up to the prison with a whole bunch of G-men or whatever. And the first one they get is Hadley. You yeah. have the right to remain silent. And I read, love Red's line. I wasn't there to see it, but I heard Hadley cried like a little girl. <laughs> and the warden is up in his office and he pulls out a gun yep. and he pulls out some bullets. And the DA is knocking on the door. And at first you think, oh, is he going to shoot it out with the right, cops? Right. There's well, a does, moment. He lowers the weapon yeah. towards the cops. And then, and then at the last moment, puts it up below his chin, mm -hmm. shoots himself. Yeah. I like to think the last thing that went through the warden's head, other than that bullet. <laughs> other than that bullet. <laughs> was how Andy Dufresne ever got the best of him. Ah, it's great. Such a great great delivery of yep. that line and other, we're other than that bullet we're back with the guys and they're handing it handing out the mail and uh red says after the warden deprived us of his company i got a postcard in the mail it was blank but the postmark said port hancock texas that's where andy crossed andy dufresne who crawled through a river of shit and came out clean on the other side andy dufresne headed for the pacific you know, just reading those lines almost makes me cry. Yeah. 
it just it's so beautiful mm -hmm. what's what happens in this film well because red loves that man too yeah and seeing yeah. his friend you know finally after everything he experienced finally getting a chance to you know get away and have some kind of peace yeah it gets me mm -hmm. it really the love because that's because it's a love story too yeah, it is. you know between these guys yep and then all the guys are sitting around and what are they talking about they're telling the andy stories yeah they're telling the beer story they're telling he's become this folk legend yeah and red smiling listen to stories too but he's also sad sometimes it makes me sad though and to being gone I have to remind myself that some birds aren't meant to be caged. Their feathers are just too bright. And when they fly away, the part of you that knows it was a sin to lock them up does rejoice. But still, the place you live in is that much more drab and empty that they're gone. I guess I just miss my friend. Most of all, I miss, I miss my, my friend. friend. Yeah. yeah. He's a poet. Yeah. Parole. Kind of starts off the same. Yeah. Red sits down. The parole officers are young. Yeah. And they ask the same question. Do you feel you've been rehabilitated? He doesn't give the speech. Mm -mm. Rehabilitated? Well, now let me see. You know, I don't have any idea what that means. And they try to start to explain. He's like, no, no, <laughs> no. I, I know, know, I know yeah. the words, Sonny. I know what you think it means. I know what you think it means. <laughs> to me, it's just a made up word. A politician's word so that young fellows like yourself can wear a suit and a tie and have a job. What do you really want to know? Am I sorry for what I did? Well, I am. There's not a day goes by I don't feel regret. Not because I'm in here, because you think I should. I love that. Not because you think I should. Right. Because that's what he was doing before. Mm -hmm. That's what he was saying, what I think you want to hear. Right. I look back on the way I was then. A young, stupid kid who committed that terrible crime. I want to talk to him. I want to try to talk some sense to him. Tell him the way things are, but I can't. That kid's long gone, and this old man is all that's left. I gotta live with that. Rehabilitated is just a bullshit word. So you go on and stamp your form, Sonny, and stop wasting my time. Because to tell you the truth, I don't give a shit. Approved. <laughs> And Red walks out. And the shot, by the way, is the opposite shot we saw from Brooks. Mm -hmm. Brooks, we saw from the front because it was a big deal for him to step over the barrier. Red, we see from behind, mm -hmm. walking out. Mm -hmm. um, he looks around and he looks back and he's on the bus. And he's not clutching that no. bar the way that Brooks was. He gets the same room as Brooks, sees Brooks was here. He's bagging groceries just like mm -hmm. Brooks was. He asked permissions to go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom, boss? You don't need permission. You, you, need, you can just go and pee. 40 years I've been asking permission to piss. I can't squeeze a drop without say so. Right now, it's looking like Brooks. Yeah. You know? It's all being set up. Yep. And he looks in the window of a pawn shop, and the first thing he's looking at is guns. Yeah. Because he's his first thought is, how, what can I do to get put back in prison? Terrible thing to live in fear. Brooks Hadlin knew it. Knew it all too well. All I want is to be back where things make sense. Where I won't have to be afraid all the time. Only one thing stops me. A promise I made to Andy. He looks at above the guns in the pawn shop. Our compass. Yeah, compass. He's on a red pickup truck. So, in film school... There's a lot of talk about color theory. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that filmmakers often do is they withhold a color. So that color takes on significance. Oh, and one of the things I learned from Bruce Block, who is my great teacher at uh, USC, mm -hmm. who I teach from his book when I teach about color theory, was one of the best examples is that red in Shawshank Redemption is the color of freedom. 
Mm. It is a color almost never appears in the film. It only comes up a few times. And the most important is this red truck, which is so striking mm -hmm. because we're in such a drab place. And so yeah. in my class, I show that as an example of using a color to symbolize something and giving it visual power and that this symbolizes freedom. Wow. Watching one of the documentaries, Frank Darabont, who's gone to film schools, mm -hmm. is continually asked how he chose red to be the color of freedom and why he chose that truck as the red truck. He never intended that at all. <laughs> <laughs> that was the coolest looking truck. <laughs> That's why he picked it. There you go. It just shows that all of us teachers are full of shit. <laughs> Now, the question I had to decide is, am I going to continue to teach it as an example? I think you should. Absolutely. Because it does work that way. Yep. He gets out of the truck and he starts to walk in. He's looking at his compass. He walks through the trees. He finds an old rock wall, mm -hmm. which was totally built by the art department. Oh, wow. That's a lot of work, by the way, to build I'm a sure. rock wall. That's heavy, heavy work. He walks up. He finds the rock, a little obsidian rock. He turns it over. Digs up a little bit. Underneath is a tin box with a cruise ship on it. Mm -hmm. It's a great choice of what's on the <laughs> thing. Opens it up. Inside is an envelope wrapped in plastic. No narration. He opens the envelope, sees a stack of $50 bills, and Red looks around, afraid he's going to get caught. Right. That's Morgan Freeman's idea to oh, look around. Yeah, makes sense. And it's funny because uh, Frank Darabont said, I don't understand why. And then when he saw him do it, he went, oh. Because you're a crook. Yeah. You're, yeah, you're living fear. Of and course you're, you're a black man in that time. With a stack of $50 bills. With a stack bills, of $50 bills. You right. look around. Uh, opens up a letter and it says, Dear Red. If you're reading this, you've gotten out. And if you've come this far, maybe you're willing to come a little further. You remember the name of the town, don't you? Morgan says it. Say what to nail. I could use a good man to help me get my project on wheels. I'll keep an eye out for you. And the chessboard ready. Remember, Red, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. I will be hoping that this letter finds you and finds you well. Your friend, Andy. Again, I'm getting choked up. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. It's just such a, a moving thing. Yeah. And it's so simple. You know, it's not. These aren't big events. Yep. This isn't, you know, people dying and like, it's very simple mm -hmm. and very uh, lovely. It really gets me. I think lovely is a great way to describe yeah. it. Yeah. And we hear the theme um, and we there's a beautiful shot of him walking and all of the moths and whatever grasshoppers mm -hmm. are flying around, which of course was just, that just happened. They didn't <laughs> plan that. And we're back in his room and we see that same chair that Brooks climbed up on to kill himself. And Red opens a knife, and we hear him say, Get busy living, or get busy dying. That's goddamn right. And Red exits with his suitcase, and the camera pans up, and we see Brooks was here. So was Red. So was Red. For the second time in my life, I'm guilty of committing a crime. Parole violation. Of course, I doubt they'll toss up any roadblocks for that. Not for an old crook like me. Fort Hancock, Texas, please. He gets a bus ticket. He's on a bus. I find I'm so excited I can barely sit still or hold a thought in my head. I think it's the excitement only a free man can feel. A free man at the start of a long journey whose conclusion is uncertain. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. I hope. Want to know something interesting? Frank Darabont wanted to end the film here. Oh! With Red on the bus. And the studio said, no, <laughs> you have to have them get together. <laughs> And they said, we'll come up with more money. And they went to shoot. It's actually shot in the Caribbean in St. Okay. Croix. And Frank was like, no, no, but I'll shoot it because you're making me. But, yeah. and they said, and they said, look, if you really, really hate it, we won't put it in the movie. Right. We love the film, but we really feel so strongly. We want you to go do this and then we'll see. And they go down the Caribbean and all the crew was so happy because they had spent months shooting in a prison. <laughs> so this was all so fun. And they do this shot of where we get to, which is. Andy is on a boat, 
on the beach yeah. and he's restoring this boat and he looks off into the distance and there is red. Yeah. Frank Darabont, by the way, wrote lines for this scene and he just had them, they get together and we see them, you know, in a high angle shot yeah. and that's the end of the film. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful shot of when Andy first sees red coming, the smile on his face of, you know, just joy and that he's going to be reunited with his friend and them walking towards each other and embracing like that's such a great moment and i love that darabont didn't let him have dialogue yep. like it's it's a pulls back it's a pullback shot right and he was wise enough to know when he did see it he went i was wrong yeah this is what it has to be i still think it could have ended there i do too and been a powerful film but I, this way is just like satisfying you know there are certainly times not to give the audience what they want right this is one where I, I think you do. Yeah. You know, it's like we need that, mm -hmm. that closure. feeling, that closure. You need that closure. Um, and the last thing we see, by the way, is this is in memory of Alan Green. Alan Green was Frank Darabont's agent who died of AIDS right before they started shooting. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, what a shame. Yeah. So uh, it goes into post-production. It goes into screenings. It tests through the roof. Mm -hmm. We've heard this several times. Everyone said, this is an amazing film. This is a great film. They're like, this is going to be a... A huge release. Opening night came along. Frank Darabont went to the Cinerama Dome in Hollywood. And nobody was there. Yep. I I just, I remember how this did not perform at the box office. And I was shocked. It made $16 million in the box office. Mm -hmm. It cost 25. That's a bomb. Yeah. I mean, it died. And then seven Academy Award nominations. Right. Yeah. And of course, what was killing it is Pulp Fiction and Forrest Gump just destroyed it right, you know right. and it got all these nominations and they re-released it in the film in the theater so now and it did make about 50 million dollars mm -hmm. so now it's a kind of break even movie mm -hmm. you know because with marketing and all that stuff and uh it didn't win a single uh oscar the nominations by the way were for um best picture screenplay actor for morgan freeman sound mixing cinematography for deacons a score and editing mm. gets nothing and then on home video, it is the biggest home video rental of 1995. And then the most interesting thing, I actually think this even more than home video is what made it uh, what it is today, mm. which is that Ted Turner bought Castle Rock Pictures. And Ted Turner put it on TNT and TBS all the time. Yes, he did. And people just watched it and it was on so much that everyone just fell in love with it. Yeah. It is to this day, one of the most played movies on TV. I think it's number two and I think Casablanca is number one. Wow. Which surprised me. Yeah, I think I, that's what I read. I rarely see Casablanca. But but this is like, if you, and that's why all of us have said, like I was switching channels and yeah. there was, cause it's always on. Yeah. Um, I'll always stop for like an hour to watch. And, and it's funny. Uh, Frank, you know, so the, all these Christian interpretations, mm -hmm. and the last one is we're now in heaven. Yeah, you know, that's oh, yeah. where we've that's we've we've reached the promised land, right? Um, and uh, there are also interpretations that are totally the opposite. That Andy is the man of science, you mm. know, that he is to it's completely a logical person who has just self made, self actualized, and believes in himself, and logically goes down the steps necessary to accomplish his goal. Yeah, um, I can see that. Um, and of course, I think what you said, which is I, kind of what I think, is that the prison is a metaphor for life. Mm -hmm. You know, that this is, we have our adversity and we have to have hope or faith and, mm -hmm. you know, hold on to what we believe in and hold on to our own identities. Yeah. We've reached the end of Shawshank Redemption. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I have final thoughts. What are your final thoughts? Do you have any? Yeah, sure. I mean, I always got something to say, you know, <laughs> <laughs> my final thoughts would be just that, um, as I say, with a lot of films that we cover here on the cinephiles is if you haven't seen this one in a while, and I don't know how you haven't, uh, you have, must revisit it again and again. And as you get older, revisit it more and more. This is one of these films that like fine wine, it just gets better and better with age as you get older. And you find different things to pull out of it, different things to find for yourself, different lessons, different uh, uh, reactions, and also different things to connect to. Maybe you've got a friend like Andy. Maybe you've got a friend like Red. Maybe you've been through these experiences. Maybe you've seen some evil from people in higher up places who use the scripture or the Bible to defend their evil. Maybe you've seen people abuse power, be like uh, uh, Hadley does as a guard, to carry out their more nefarious or baser instincts. Maybe that's happened in your life. So you can get something from this. Or maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe you're struggling with going forward in your world. What are you going to do? Are you worried? Uh, you know, Maybe you're going through some mental health stuff. This film can provide you some catharsis. This film 
can provide you with some comfort, a path to take. And so in like most great films, it is more than just a film because it echoes into all of our lives. And I imagine this is why it's one of the most played films ever and why it's one of the most beloved films ever because it echoes throughout our lives for the rest of our lives whenever we watch it. There are so, there's so much to still get from this film. So first of all, that was great. Oh, thank you. And second of all, thank you for giving me enough time to think of my own final thoughts. <laughs> Good. It's very appreciated. Here, here's, what I, here's what I think. You know how I've said, and I think you said it too in the course of this show, that uh, it's sad that Hollywood doesn't make a certain kind of movie anymore. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's a good point. This is because what is this film? Is that it's not? There's not action. There's not. Th it's not. It's thrilling. It's a. It's. It's. There's tension in it. But what it is, this is a really great story, and it's a really unique story. And it's funny. You look at what was nominated for Best Picture that year. It was uh, Pulp Fiction, Forrest Gump, Quiz Show, and I forget what the other one was. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and they're all movies that are just stories and they're all really different and they're saying we're we're in hollywood isn't so much in for features in the storytelling business as much anymore mm. like let's do romantic comedies and musicals and westerns and all these kinds of things they are mostly in the big property business mm -hmm. and the big spectacle business yeah. and they do those really well and i like going to see them but nobody's we're not making shawshank that much mm -hmm. you know just like here's a really unique, interesting story yeah. that takes that that is told in a very different way with all this voiceover where I mean one of the interesting things is like the person talking isn't the main character in the film. The main character in the film is one that's hard to get to know. Yeah. The main character in the film doesn't change that much. I mean, he opens up to his friends mostly, but he's kind of the same yeah. in a lot of ways. Like it's a very, very different kind of film, and that's kind of what makes it so interesting? And this is where I go. I want people to be making more of this kind of film, a film with broad appeal made by the studio. Mm -hmm. Cause this, you can't make this as an independent film, right? You know, that really tells a beautiful, meaningful, lovely, emotional, heartfelt story. Yeah. You know, that's kind of what we're missing a little mm -hmm. bit of. So that's what we think of the Shawshank Redemption. I'm sure you have your thoughts on the Shawshank Redemption, and we would love to hear them. We'd love to hear them on our Facebook page. Do a search for the Cinephiles. Of course, you can leave comments on YouTube. While you're there, why don't you subscribe to the feed? If you don't like subscribing on YouTube, go over to iTunes, an even better place to subscribe to because it really helps us come up in those standings. Mm -hmm. While you're on iTunes, maybe a review would be nice. Um, if you don't want to use any of those things, you're on an Android phone, well, you can use Google Play or Spotify or Stitcher, any of those places to find the Cinephiles. If you haven't seen Shawshank Redemption, I don't know how you've avoided it, but the best way to do it at this point is to visit cinephiles.net and buy the Blu-ray or stream it from Amazon Prime. And of course, we would love your support on Patreon, patreon.com slash the cinephiles. We've put out a whole bunch of cinephile shorts. I think this week we're going to be putting out one on the Oscars and mm -hmm. particularly on their discussion of changing their format. Uh, so you can take a listen to that. That's uh, patreon.com slash the cinephiles. If you want to reach me, you can reach me on Twitter at SR Morris, on Instagram at SR Morris One. John, where can they reach you? You can always reach me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. And thanks again to the patrons who suggested this film. Absolutely. Uh, it's been an absolute joy to revisit this one with Steve. Um, I think that's it for this week. And we'll see you next time on The Cinephiles. <laughs>